and underwritten by Sedgwick County. KPTS welcomes comments from the public on its broadcast of the County Commission hearings. Viewers are invited to write to County Commission Broadcast, KPTS, 320 West 21st Street, Wichita, Kansas, 67203. Good morning, I'm Christy Zukovich. Welcome to the April 22nd Sedgwick County Commission meeting. We're glad you're joining us this morning. We'd like to take this time to let you know about activities going on around Sedgwick County. And first off, we have a free opportunity for you to go out and enjoy the zoo tomorrow. It is for their Sedgwick County Zoo Party for the Planet. It will be from 9 to 2, a fair to learn all about the environment. And of course, uh, again, admission is free, so hope that you will go out and enjoy the zoo. Also to remind you, coming up on Saturday, it's at the Interest Bank Arena. It is professional bull riders. And I really tried hard, commissioners, to think about something that I could do with bull riding with you, and then I thought I probably should just not go there today. So we got something a little bit later. But uh, also coming up at the arena May 8th and the 16th, the Wichita Force. Of course, you can find their full event schedule on the uh, Sedgwick County website as well. And coming up at Exploration Place Saturday, it is Family Engineering Day. A again, a good opportunity for you to head out with your family and enjoy Exploration Place and learn to build some different things. So, But commissioners, we're going to talk a little bit this morning. We're not going to sing. I thought about making you try to sing along again. That didn't go so well last week. No. <laughs> I'm pretty sure, though, Commissioner Norton knows the words to driving my life away. Eddie Rabbit, remember that? Windshield wipers. Flapping time. See? <laughs> <laughs> well, we're not going to go there. We're not going to sing, but we are going to talk about driving and tires specifically. And I've asked Susan Erlenwein if she would come up and give us just a little overview of what happened last week with the tire roundup. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioners. The end of last week, we had a tire roundup where residents and businesses could bring tires for free. Thursday was set aside for uh, 
businesses and governments because they tend to have huge trucks and bring large tires and we didn't want to mingle those with the people who were backing up a trailer for the first time and have an accident. So we were trying to have safety caution there. Then Friday and Saturday we had uh, tires brought in from residents and this was at the Public Works West Yard on Southwest Street, 4701 Southwest. Public Works crew did a great job. You can see from the tires there someone unloading a tire. You can look at the very size there we had large small tires uh, look at the large ones in that photo in the lineup of cars even though we had a lot of rain uh, people were really coming to this event and we had uh, over 2,000 vehicles come in even with all that rain it was just around 2,050 vehicles I'd really like to thank uh, the people from uh, environmental resources my staff Joe Oliver, Joe Renfro, and Scott Bowen for going out there and working in the rain and helping these people, and also all of the people at the Public Works West Yard who really did a great job of going out there and helping this event become successful. We don't have the final numbers yet on the tires because we didn't count them as they came off, but uh, as they are taken away, we'll get a count later and we'll get that back to you in a full report. So I really uh, want to thank everyone who participated in this and all the residents who are cleaning up our environment and getting those tires out of the way. They're a nuisance on the road and the ditch. They hold water that can breed mosquitoes, so it was really an appropriate event. We do this every several years to help the community. I believe that was the last slide. Thank you very much. Thank you, Susan. All right, so see, you're off the hook today. It was more show and tell. We didn't make you do anything. I'm going to give you a break next week because we don't have a meeting next week, so be ready for May is all I have to say. <laughs> Today's agenda, though, we've got a lot of things going on. We have two proclamations this morning, commissioners. We have a number of folks who are being appointed to our boards, and so for that we are very thankful. We also have a few um, grant requests for uh, the corrections department, ways that we can continue to provide corrections programs, and then we'll hear about an off-agenda item for household hazardous waste events. So more good news, more good things to vote on. So Chairman Ranzaw, how about we get the meeting underway? Absolutely. Thank you, Christy. With that, I'll call to order the regular meeting of the Board of Sedgwick County Commissioners for April 22nd, 2014. <laughs> Madam Clerk, first item. Invocation to be led by Father Dan Dooling, Catholic Diocese of Wichita. Please remain standing for the flag salute. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gifts in which you continue to bestow upon each and every one of us. You have showered down your blessings upon all of us in many different ways, in ways that we do not always recognize. May we all come to recognize the gifts in which you have, which have come from you. And may we be good stewards of those gifts and all things that you've entrusted to our care. As we are leaders in our community, may you bestow your graces upon us. May you continue to guide us to make good decisions for your greater honor and glory. May we especially keep in mind the poor, the vulnerable, the sick. May we respect all life at all costs. In a very special way, we ask you to send down your Holy Spirit upon this room and all who will take part in this meeting. May you help them to look at others before looking at themselves. Give them all the graces they need to be good servants to their fellow men. Grant that they may have a humble and servant's heart. We ask this through the intercession of our Blessed Virgin Mary, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Father, for being here today. Madam Clerk, next item. Roll call. Commissioner Unruh? Present. Commissioner Norton? Present. Commissioner Howell? Present. Commissioner Peter John? Present. Chairman Ransall? Present. Next item, please. Consideration of minutes. Item A. Special meeting minutes of March 24th, 2015. Commissioner Unruh was absent. Commissioner, do you have the meetings, the minutes before you? Are there any changes? Mr. Chairman, I move that we approve the minutes for the meeting of March 24th, 2015. I'd second that. Call the vote, please. Commissioner Unruh? Abstain. Commissioner Norton? Aye. Commissioner Howell? Aye. Commissioner Peter John? Aye. Chairman Ransall? Aye. Next item, please. Proclamations, item B. Proclamation declaring Kimmy Whitmore Day. 
Commissioners, I have the following proclamation to read into the record. Whereas the worldwide fraternity of free and accepted Masons has long championed the need and responsibility of lifelong and virtuous education, and whereas the Albert Pike Masonic Lodge Number 303 in Wichita, Kansas, is continuing its dedication to the community and public schools, and has set out to distinguish Wichita's finest educators in the selection and promotion of the Albert Pike Lodge Teacher of the Year Award, and whereas our teachers keep uh, democracy alive by laying down the foundation for citizenship and demonstrate to the community and the world their commitment to our future. And whereas the selection committee comprised of men and women from various backgrounds and vocations have unanimously selected Kimmy Whitemore for her dedication in teaching music at music students at Jardine STEM and Queer Explorations uh, Academy School. Now therefore be it resolved that I, Richard Ranzel, Chairman of the Board of Cedric County Commissioners, do hereby Proclaim April 24, 2015, as the Kimmy Whitemore Day in recognition of her service to this county, the Wichita Public School District, Jardine STEM and Queer, Career uh, Exploration Academy School, and the many students and peer faculty that she has impacted through her dedication and fortitude in the discharge of her duties. In, in commendation of the qualities, capabilities, and commitment that she brings to promote academic excellence in building and internally motivated confidence in teaching self-reliance to her students and all those around her. Commissioners, what's the will of the board? I move we adopt the proclamation. Second. Madam Clerk, call the vote. Commissioner Unruh? Aye. Commissioner Norton? Aye. Commissioner Howell? Aye. Commissioner Peter John? Aye. Chairman Ransell? Aye. And we have Sheldon Lawrence with the Albert Pike, Pike Masonic Lodge here today to present the award. Chairman Ranzo and County Commissioners, I'm Sheldon Lawrence, past master of Albert Pike Masonic Lodge, located at the Kansas Masonic Home. The Albert Pike Lodge wants to thank the Board of County Commissioners for their support over the last 16 years that we have done the Teacher of the Year ceremony. Each year we pick from nominations submitted by USD 259 principals. Uh, as in the past, it's always hard to do because every entry we have is really worth it. And so we do have quite a discussion. This year, our judge is selected to teacher submitted by Laura Atherley, principal of Jardine STEM and Career Explorations Academy, with an attachment letter from a student, Nini Ben. Our teacher is the instrumental music instructor for the 6th, 7th, and 8th grade at Jardine, USD 259. It is my pleasure to introduce from the Fine Arts Department, USD 259, Director Charles Sean, Ch Sean Chastain. From uh, Jardine, the Assistant Principal, Amy Ines, And our Albert Pike Teacher of the Year for 2015, Kim Whitmore. Kim. Thank you. Am I supposed to speak? <laughs> I'm sorry. I wasn't prepared to speak right now, but this is a huge honor, and I'm just grateful to the Masonic Lodge for recognizing um, teachers in this way each year. Um, we have a big impact on the future of the community in Wichita, and it is just really nice of them to, to go to all this effort to, to recognize teachers. Thank you. Commissioner Unruh. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. We we'll just want to uh, offer, again, our congratulations uh, uh, in recognition of your outstanding service to the, to the children of that school, but also to our community at large. Not only to you, but to the administration that uh, helps provide um, the structure for you to carry out your unique capabilities. Um, I, was, I was just wondering, though, in a, uh, in a magnet school that's uh, science, technology, Engineering, mathematics. I mean, there's room for music in the arts. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, we're we're glad that you can keep that balanced. And uh, s someone that uh, not very musically inclined, I really appreciate your talents. Thank you, Commissioner Norton. Well, we're very proud of you, and, and you know, I think all of us in our lifetimes can remember back to that teacher that made a difference. Uh, obviously our parents and, and friends and church members always made a difference, but I think we can all hearken back to a teacher that inspired us, motivated us, pushed us, uh, controlled us, whatever it might be, 
to do our best, and uh, we honor you for that. Uh, I think about a, a music teacher, an instructional teacher in a STEM class. We all know that there's a linkage between folks that understand music and meter and counting and, and uh, have the discipline to do that, many times do really well in math and STEM kinds of things. So I think it's a natural match in a STEM school. And finally, from raising five kids that I insisted all took band or an instrument through fifth, sixth, and seventh grade, boy, do I honor you today. Uh, thank you. Because I listened to them for hours blowing through the end of some kind of instrument, and I don't know how you do it day after day after day, but thank you for what you do. You represent all teachers in public education that try to educate the masses, regardless of where they come from, what baggage they bring with them to school, to make them good, productive citizens in our democracy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Congratulations, Ms. Whitmore. Thank you for everything you do for your students. Thank you. Next item, please. Item C, proclamation declaring the 50th anniversary of, Fos of the Foster Grandparent Program. Commissioners, I have the following proclamation to read into the record. Whereas 2015 marks the 50th anniversary of the National Foster Grandparent Program, the belief that inspired its founding in 1965 could not be true today for the local Foster Grandparent Program at Catholic Charities, now in operation for 35 years. Namely, that low-income elders have extraordinary gifts to share, with vulnerable children in a wide variety of settings, and whereas the social, emotional, and academic support offered by loving members has transformed the lives of both children and volunteers. The simple, cost-effective formula has stood the test of time, having weathered winds of political change to emerge in 2015 as a trustworthy and relevant model to serve at-risk children for the next 50 years. And whereas, because the program efforts during the last year, this community benefited from 123 foster grandparents who provided 117,241 hours of service at 64 sites in Cedric County to uh, 3,249 students, and whereas children and special exceptional needs or circumstances identified as limiting their academic, social, or economic development have benefited from these efforts, and older volunteers report lower mortality rates, lower rates of depression, fewer physical limitations, and higher levels of well-being. Now, therefore, be it resolved with I, Richard Ransall, Chairman of the Board of Cedric County Commissioners, to hereby proclaim 2015 as the 50th anniversary of the Foster Grandparent Program in Cedric County and call upon our citizens to recognize the enormous contributions made by older adults, older adults who have volunteered as foster grandparents to benefit children and in the process have helped themselves remain productive citizens. Commissioners, what's the will of the Board? I move we adopt the proclamation. Second. Madam Clerk, call the vote. Commissioner Unruh? Aye. Commissioner Norton? Aye. Commissioner Howell? Aye. Commissioner Peter John? Aye. Chairman Ransaw? Aye. And we have Lyndon Drew, Program Director, to accept the proclamation. Thank you, Commissioners. We really appreciate your support over the years. Catholic Charities has been a sponsor of this program since 1981, and it's been my privilege to have been a part of this program since the year 2000. We consider this a program that's a win-win, both for the older adults who are the volunteers and for the kids who get their one-on-one -on -one attention. Throughout the year, our folks work 15 to 40 hours a week, all of them committing that amount of time to work with our kids, either in schools or in preschools, getting them ready for school. And all of our attention is on those kids who need the extra help, and we can provide that with your support, and we really thank you for the years of support you've provided us. Thank you very much. Thank you for everything you do for our community. <laughs> Next item, please. Donations, item D. Donation of $2,000 to the Cedric County Emergency Medical Service from Air Products and Chemicals Incorporated. Good morning, Commissioner. Scott Headley, your EMS Director. Uh, before you for consideration today is a donation in the amount of $2,000 from Air Products and Chemicals located at 6601 South Ridge Road. As you know, 
Eric Prodigal's, this particular plant has a long-standing history of donation to the community, specifically to EMS. Over the past couple of years, they've donated, including today, $6,500 just to EMS alone. And I know they've made other donations to other public safety entities within the county and others within the community. We've had a good working relationship and a long-standing partnership. Uh, this money will go a long way to support uh, some safety programs within EMS, and we know those folks are very safety conscious. I know Mr. Norton's very familiar with them, and recently I here took a tour of their plant. So with that, I would like to recognize I have a couple special guests here today, Ms. Melissa Okers and Mr. Ross Hufford, who is a plant manager uh, for Air Products and Chemicals, and I'd ask Mr. Hufford to come up. He'd like to say a few words uh, to the commission. Mr. Hufford? Good morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you for attending the meeting and giving me uh, these couple of minutes. I'm Ross Hufford. I'm the site manager at Air Products Wichita Performance Materials Facility. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Air Products, we're a $10 billion a year revenue industrial gas and chemical company. We're headquartered in Allentown, Pennsylvania. We've got over 20,000 employees worldwide in over 50 countries around the world. We supply innovative solutions to the energy, environment, and emerging markets. These include semiconductor materials, refinery hydrogen, coal gasification, natural gas liquefaction, advanced coatings, and adhesives. At our Wichita facility, our 80 employees produce ingredients for polyurethane foams as well as coatings and adhesives. Uh, at Air Products, we have a long-standing tradition of support in helping the communities where we have plants as well as the communities where our employees and their families live. Our goal is to make our communities better places in which to live and work. We do so because it's the right thing to do as citizens of those communities. We realize that Air Products' continued growth and success is closely tied to the vitality, uh, vitality of our communities. Quality of life issues such as education, human services, community development, the environment, and the arts can build up a community. We need healthy communities to operate a healthy business, including attracting and retaining uh, quality employees. Uh, this donation will go to Scott Hadley on behalf of Sedgwick County EMS. As a member of the Wichita community, I'm proud to make this donation on behalf of Air Products to the county commissioners for use at Sedgwick County EMS. Thank you. Commissioner Norton. Well, Ross, thanks for being here today. I, I did enjoy my tour. Uh, Air Products is one of those jewels of the south side that a lot of people don't know about, but they've been there for many years. They partner with OxyChem for some of their raw materials. It, it adds to that uh, industrial complex on the south side. We appreciate the, the donation, but we also appreciate the longstanding jobs and value that you give to the community. I'm glad today that you're wearing shocker colors instead of Purdue colors. <laughs> uh, you, I, I go in the other day and he's wearing Purdue Boilermaker shirt. I'm, I don't get it. So uh, thank you for, uh, you know, shocking it up a little bit. You're welcome. Uh, Air Products is, is a great company. I've been involved for many, many years. They take uh, their community service uh, seriously, but they also take safety and, and the ability to produce the kinds of products they do, which can be very hazardous, but always keep in mind the safety of the community. And they have a long-standing history of, of no incidents and taking care of their business while taking care of the community's safety at the same time. And we appreciate that. So thanks for being here today, Ross. I appreciate it. And Melissa, thanks to you, too. Thank you. So. Thank you. Thank you very much for the donation and everything you, you do for the community. And we appreciate it a lot. Thank you. With that, I'd recommend you accept the donation and authorize the chairman to sign the necessary documents and a letter of appreciation and recognizing their products for their ongoing commitment to the community and their generosity. So moved. Second. Call the vote, please. Commissioner Unruh? Aye. Commissioner Norton? Aye. Commissioner Howell? Aye. Commissioner Peter John? Aye. Chairman Ransall? Aye. Thank you. Next item, please. Appointments. Item E. Resolution reappointing Reverend Dave Fulton to the Cedric County Mental Health Advisory Board. Good morning, Commissioners. Jennifer Magana, Acting County Counselor. Uh, 
each commissioner has three appointments to the Mental Health Advisory Board. Uh, this is Commissioner Peter John's reappointment of uh, Reverend Dave Fulton. Dave Fulton has completed a four-year term, and this resolution would uh, reappoint uh, Reverend Fulton for another four-year term to expire April 21st, 2019. I recommend you adopt the resolution. And Jennifer, could we take... Uh EF and G you may. together you may. if, if that's the will up. of the board. Yes. Uh, on resolution F, that is an appointment of Jim Grohalski um, to complete the unexpired term of the late Richard, ba Judge Richard Ballinger. Um, this uh, vacancy was uh, under Commissioner Norton's appointment, uh, but now a, a vacancy exists due to Judge Ballinger's passing. So this uh, uh, appointment would be um, uh, expiring uh, November 2018 and recommend you approve that resolution. The final resolution would be uh, a reappointing Marilyn Whipple also to the Mental Health Advisory Board for another four-year term ending April of 2019. I recommend you take those items and approve all resolutions. Commissioner, what's the will of the board? You move we adopt the resolutions for EF and G. I'll second that motion. Okay. Madam Clerk, call the vote. Commissioner Unruh? Aye. Commissioner Norton? Aye. Commissioner Howell? Aye. Commissioner Peter John? Aye. Chairman Ransall? Aye. And we have... We have both Dave and Jim. D Dave and Jim today. are both here? Yep. Okay. So, all right. Please raise your right hand. I do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of the State of Kansas, and faithfully discharge the duties of the Office of Sedgwick County Mental Health Advisory Board. So help me God. I do. I do. It is a pleasure to serve on this board. I am not worthy to take the judge's remaining spot, but I will do my best to fulfill this, uh, this requirement. Thank you very much. Commissioners, it's an honor to serve. Um, people have problems, and uh, we are privileged to have ComCare as an agency that meets those problems, and uh, I think they do it in a distinguished manner, uh, the best I've seen. So I'm proud to serve. Thank you so much. Thank you. Madam Clerk, next item. Item H, resolution reappointing Sanford Alexander to the Wichita Cedric County Access Advisory Board. Good morning, Commissioners. Jennifer Magania uh, again. Uh, this resolution reappoints Sanford Alexander to a one-year term to the Access Advisory Board. I recommend you adopt the resolution. And once again, can we combine that with item J? We can. This board is also the advisory board. Uh, re this resolution would reappoint Brian Powers uh, by Carl, uh, Commissioner Peter John for another one year term and recommend you adopt that resolution. Mr. Chairman, item I. I. Well, we're going to. Uh, H, I, and J. Well, yeah, we're not going to do item I. We're going to table that. Okay, I'm sorry. Oh. So, recommending uh, adoption of items H and J at this time. Right. I so move that we adopt um, agenda items H and J. Uh, second. We have a motion and a second. Madam Clerk, call the vote. Commissioner Unruh? Aye. Commissioner Norton? Aye. Commissioner Howell? Aye. Commissioner Peter John? Aye. Chairman Ransall? Aye. Next item, please. Item I, resolution reappointing Glenn Davison to the Wichita Cedric County Access Advisory Board. Good morning, Commissioners. Recommend that you table this item. So moved. Second. Call the vote, please. Commissioner Unruh? Aye. Commissioner Norton? Aye. Commissioner Howell? Aye. Commissioner Peter John? Aye. Chairman Ransall? Aye. Next item, please. Public hearing, item K. Commissioner, uh, pardon me, uh, Mr. Chairman, I believe at this time you wanted to take an off agenda item. That's right. We do need to take an off agenda item. Commissioner Peter John? Uh, Mr. Chairman? I'm going to make a motion that we take up an off agenda item uh, concerning a household hazardous waste remote collection event uh, in Mays, Kansas. I'll second that motion. 
Madam Clerk, call the vote. Commissioner Unruh? Aye. Commissioner Norton? Aye. Commissioner Howell? Aye. Commissioner Peter John? Aye. Chairman Mansell? Aye. Good morning, Commissioners. Susan Erlenwein, Department of Environmental Resources. Cedric County has a household hazardous waste facility. It's located at 801 Stillwell, and this is a facility where residents can bring materials that they no longer need at their home, such as unwanted paints, oils, solvents, cleaners, even fluorescent light bulbs. So we encourage residents to go to that facility. It's open 9 to uh, 5, Tuesday through Friday, 9 to 3 on Saturdays. But in order to better serve our community, we also offer five remote household hazardous waste collection events throughout the community each year. And our first remote event is going to come up on May 2nd. It's a Saturday in the city of Mays. It will be located at the Mays Public Works Facility. That's at 5600 North Mays Road. It will be from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. on that Saturday, May 2nd again. So we encourage anyone who lives in that area to bring their own wanted paints, oils, or any other materials, uh, batteries that they need to get rid of, it would be convenient for them on that date. The City of Mays has approved this agreement this past Monday night, and I'd recommend your approval and ask the Chairman to sign. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Susan. Commissioner Peter John? Just a couple questions. Uh, you said uh, we're holding this up in Mays. Can you be more specific in terms of exactly where in Mays? Uh, the Mays Public Works Facility, 5600 North Mays Road. Okay. Um, and and uh, the, the time that they're going to be operating? 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Okay. And I know we hold these events around the county from time to time, but but uh, um, uh, we're not putting. We're not having these all in the springtime, are we? No, uh, I have one lined up f at uh, Textron Beach Plant at uh, West East Central on June 13th. There's another one lined up June 20th uh, in Hayesville, and I have one lined up at the Extension in your district in the first Saturday in November. So we'll have one in the fall, and I'm working with the City of Derby on uh, getting one a date set for that one right now. I think it's important, and, and folks from wherever in the county they are, they can go to. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter where they can go to any any one of those locations. And of course, Stillwell is open five days a week. That's right, and we have the uh, swap and shop area at the Stillwell facility, so people can come in and drop something off and pick up a uh, very good used product for free. All of these services are for free for the residents, so we encourage them to take advantage of it. Well, I'm glad to get that on the record. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. So, Susan, once again, this is May 2nd, which is a week from Saturday. That's correct. We will not have a commission meeting between now and then, so this That's is the why last this time to agenda. talk about it today yeah. and, and, and get it out there. So I appreciate um, that. I appreciate your efforts. And with that, I'll uh, make the motion that we approve the contract. Thank you. Second. Madam Clerk, call the vote. Commissioner Unruh? Aye. Commissioner Norton? Aye. Commissioner Howell? Aye. Commissioner Peter John? Aye. Chairman Ransall? Aye. Thank you. Now, next item, please. Public hearing, item K. A public hearing for the proposed adoption of the International Residential Code 2012 edition, published by the International Code Council, and a resolution amending, deleting, and supplementing various provisions of the Wichita Cedric County Unified Building and Trade Code. Good morning, Chairman and Commission. Tom Stoltz. I'm the Director of Metropolitan Area Planning and Construction Department, and I'm here this morning to discuss a proposed adoption of an updated residential building code uh, for the Wichita Cedric County jurisdiction. Like, all, like other uh, government organizations around the country, uh, Cedric County has historically adopted local building and professional trade codes from recognized national and international organizations. Members of these organizations are industry experts in the fields of building construction, plumbing, and electrical and mechanical code. The code guidelines they produce every three years are generally viewed as best practice for the construction industry nationwide. Uh, as you know, there are three reasons why local jurisdictions adopt code in this manner. Number one, first and foremost, is it represents 
uh, a way to enhance public safety for our citizens through best practice application regarding designs and construction of homes and commercial buildings. Secondly, it helps to ensure basic consistency between building practices, between jurisdictional lines and consideration to builder and trade professionals operating in Wichita and Sedgwick County. And finally, it serves to achieve a consistent training protocol for building professionals who are licensing or attaining continuing education in their respective field of expertise. Currently, uh, Wichita and Sedgwick County operate under the 2006 International Residential Code, which is called the IRC. For the last two years, staff and local building professionals from the Wichita Area Builders Association have been reviewing the adoption of the 2012 Residential Code into this jurisdiction. The reason this takes so long and has such an extensive review is to ensure that we understand the proposed changes within the National Code and to add local amendments that make sense for the Wichita Sedgwick County jurisdiction and our local home builders who, who actually build the houses here. As I always mention, even if this code is adopted, it remains fluid and future amendments can occur in the future. Over the last several months, staff and our local building partners have provided information regarding the 2012 IRC along with proposed amendments. This effort has resulted in the distillation of two documents. First, a listing of significant changes between the 06 code and the 12 code which we wish to adopt. And secondly, a listing of 32 proposed amendments highlighted today uh, in the resolution presented uh, before you. These documents were discussed in detail at multiple public meetings offered over the last several months, and we would be glad to drill down into any of the proposed changes or amendments and further discuss, but there are two issues two items that I wish uh, to bring up today to specifically talk about in, re in regards to residential building code. The first is the issue of requirement of carbon monoxide detectors which dominated some of our public meetings when we met with citizens and builders over the last few months. The 2012 IRC calls for carbon monoxide detector installation in the following conditions. Uh, in new home builds, detectors shall be installed outside of each separate sleeping area in the immediate vicinity of the bedrooms in dwelling units within which fuel fired appliances are installed and in dwelling units that have attached garages. That's for all new home builds. Very similar to smoke detector regulation. Uh, in existing homes, the code, the current code as written, calls for detectors to be installed as stated above where any work requiring a permit occurs in existing dwellings that have attached garages or in existing dwellings within which fueled fired appliances exist. The amendment package in today's resolution already offers a change uh, concerning existing homes. Instead of any instance, or, I'm, excuse me, instead of instances where any permit being pulled calls for a CO detector installation, our local amendment limits the permit work to roofing, siding, water heater or furnace change outs before CO de detectors would be required under code. That's how the amendment stands today and is what, before, is what before you. During our meetings with the public over the last several weeks, it has been suggested that rather than requiring the CO detectors immediate installation into existing <coughs> homes when remodel work is done, that instead a notification be left with the homeowner apprising them of changes to code and suggesting the installation of CO detectors for home safety purposes. This way a homeowner could gain compliance over time as resources were made available to add detectors to their home. The second issue I'd like to discuss uh, while we are talking about IRC today is a potential exclusion of what are known as hoop houses from building code requirements. Just recently, we have had some Wichita and Sedgwick County residents complain about regulations regarding these types of structures, and Chairman Ranzau uh, requested this issue be brought before the Commission to discuss in relation with the residential code adoption. A hoop house is defined as a small greenhouse constructed using polyethylene and PVC pipe to create a solar heated environment to raise garden or flowering plants. Most hoop houses in our local jurisdiction are less than 200 square feet and already do not require a permit. In historical instances, though, where hoop houses sizes go above 200 square feet, current language in Sedgwick County code requires engineered plans for that site and a building permit and inspection. If there is a desire to deregulate hoop house requirements within this jurisdiction, now would be a good time to do it. Uh, 
and add an additional amendment to the package already presented uh, before you today, either exempting hoop houses or partially exempting hoop houses from building code requirements. With that, I will close and request we move forward with the public hearing regarding the adoption of the 2012 International Residential Code. Staff requests deferral of voting for this adoption until the May 20 meeting of the Board of County Commissioners to allow time for any final changes to occur within the proposed resolution uh, that I presented today. <coughs> I will stand for questions whenever you're ready. Thank you, Tom. I know commissioners have several questions for you, but I think we'll have the uh, public hearing first so they can hear all the comments and then we'll bring you back up and, okay. and have some questions. Um, at this point, we will open the public hearing um, on the proposed adoption of the uh, residential code and ask if there's anyone from the public who would like to speak. Please give us your name and address. <coughs> Lonnie Wright, 1721 South Lulu, Wichita, one of your many cities. Uh, and I encourage you to pass this. This has gone through a lot of citizen uh, review and involvement. In fact, the first review was sponsored by Sedgwick County, our 2012 uh, joint jurisdictional review. That was like eight months. In 2013, we had inspectors from uh, Bel Air, Andover, Rose Hill, all around because they wanted to all work <coughs> together. We had specialists in insulation. Um, and it produced a large document because we had to do two cycles. Then last year, WABA sponsored, you know, a kind of a finishing review. So it's gone through a lot. Um, when we citizens, when we go through these uh, codes, we look at what is too strict, what is not appropriate for us, um, you know, and we modify to whatever our jurisdictions uh, are. Uh, sometimes issues come up, like the carbon monoxide. So as our homes have gotten more energy efficient. Um, it can stick in a house uh, longer. And now we have these uh, things taking air out of our homes, our dryers, uh, furnaces, uh, range hoods. They're taking out so much air, we're creating a negative pressure, and it's got to take air down from the water heater vent and pull it right into the homes. Essentially, our homes are turning into just like a plastic bubble. So it is a concern. Um, but... Chief Stoltz has brought a reasonableness to us when we implement these things. Uh, one is like these carbon monoxide detectors uh, only involved when related items are involved, but giving them a notice. He sees the value of educating the people. You know, this is a concern and kind of letting them know. And uh, we all are supporting uh, the chief uh, on that kind of easier enforcement that concentrates more on um, education and uh, voluntary compliance. So I encourage you to pass the IRC as proposed. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Hall, I think may have a question for you. Yeah, I do. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Wani, thank you for uh, being here and for uh, expressing your opinion. I, I do have a couple questions. I thought maybe you might provide some expertise considering that you do serve on some of these mechanical boards. And can you please explain what boards do you serve on that's had a discussion about this? No. What boards do you serve on that's discussed this issue? None. Oh, none. Okay. No, that's a smart Alec remark, and I apologize, Commissioner. Um, for our uh, county uh, joint jurisdictional review, that was a composite of everything, and I served as secretary. Um, I do regularly attend the uh, building, mechanical, um, electrical, and plumbing boards. So I'm kind of involved and stuff, and I've gone through... I think 14 code reviews so far. So uh, I'm not actually serving on any board. I just attend. So the um, the boards that did discuss this, can you can you characterize the discussion? You know, were they are they they aware they're aware I guess, and, and maybe I'll ask Tom this later on. But they're aware that the the IRC uh, 2012 actually has more stringent requirements than what we're proposing here today, this is actually a, a bit of a relaxation from those codes. Is that correct? Are oh, you yes. Aware? Okay. This is, uh, because this comes out of the building. Now, our trade codes, mechanical, electric, and mechanical, we're kind of a lot uh, stricter on our safety and protection. The building uh, has a real balance. What is the value of things going on? And they're commonly deal with, you know, when there are stricter requirements that come up. And that's part of the reason why we appreciate maybe a softer re 
approach to implementing some of these requirements. The discussion that you listened to, did they discuss the aspect of whether CO is heavier or the same as same density as air? Was that part of the discussion in any way? Um, I don't recall that, but that doesn't mean it didn't happen. That would have happened in the WABA's review and the parts where they present uh, to the board. And I wasn't at the WABA review as I was in ours, and I don't uh, recall that. And then, and then finally, was there any discussion about the, uh, the, the fact that these detectors have a limited lifetime of usability? In other words, they, they only work for a certain number of years and then they have to be replaced. Uh, yes, and this discussion? was a real, excuse me, this was a real education for us. Uh, Brad Crisp, the fire marshal, and um, we learned smoke detectors have a limited life also. So uh, several of the builders, they got into researching how much would be the money impact, and then uh, they see the uh, joint smoke and carbon detectors really aren't that much. They thought, well, it's really not a kind of money issue. Uh, but yes, smoke detectors or carbon, carbon monoxide detectors, uh, they have limited life. So that was part of the discussion. They were, they were aware of that? Yes. Okay, thank you. That's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Lonnie. Is anyone else from the public like to speak on this issue? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. Tom will come up. And are there any questions from commissioners for Tom or comments? Commissioner Howe? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and, and Tom, thank you for being here again and uh, for your expertise. And I was curious, uh, I noticed in the, um, the items that are called out in this uh, uh, resolution said roof it says roofing siding water heater or furnace change out work <clears throat> requiring a permit <clears throat> and uh, there are any other um, instances where someone would I said work out see work requiring a permit occurring in existing dwellings so does that mean anytime they pull a permit for work in existing structures that would uh, do something this resolution we're actually recommending would change the resolution today I think it's what you just said earlier but as the resolution is currently written, um, if they pull a permit, they say for a deck, for example, yeah. does that require the way the resolution is written right now let, that something would have to happen? Let, let me clear that up. Okay, thank you. The way the the way the 2012 IRC code reads today, any permit pulled would kick in the regulation mandating CO detectors put into the house in in the locations that I read. Um, if you put a deck on your house, that didn't make a lot of sense to us, and it didn't make a lot of sense to the mechanical board and, and the builders why that should kick in a CO detector requirement. So we wrote the amendment specifying roofing, siding, furnace, and uh, water heater. Now, this is in existing homes. Um, and that's the way the resolution got printed. That's what got sent to you. Uh, we can justify each of those four things at, with local instances where we've had CO um, collection problems. Uh, roofing, for example, um, doesn't sound related to, to gas-fired equipment, but what happens is through the roofing strip down and replacement procedure, the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the exhaust somehow gets blocked and the CO gets into the house, so we, we added roofing and siding because of that. Uh, furnace replacement, water heater replacement, self-explanatory. After we printed this resolution and started taking it out to the public and having all these meetings and we met with the advisory boards, then it was thought, why not just educate people on the front end here uh, instead of mandating uh, a homeowner who's going to put a water heater in, all of a sudden has to put in four, five, six, seven CO detectors on that day or at the time of that water heater installation, why not just give them notification and we do that through two mechanisms. That's what's being, that's what I'm asking you today. That is not in the resolution. We would we would support adding it to that okay. amendment. Uh, and the contractor and the inspector would leave documentation telling the homeowner the risks of uh, carbon monoxide poisoning sickness, um, suggesting to them that they think about adding that to their home, but not regulating it at this time. Going on, uh, so I, I, I do understand your, your uh, recommended change to this. I, I think that's uh, certainly a, a good idea. But if someone does replace a hot water tank or a furnace, um, it is required that they pull a permit, an inspector does come into the home and inspect the installation. If there's anything wrong with the flue pipe or, or whatever, they would force, uh, it, it would require that they change those 
things to bring them up to code and make them safe before they would be able to approve that inspection. Is that correct? Yes, we do an on-site inspection on those installations. I am curious. If someone replaced a hot water tank and they came in and they inspected that installation and they saw something wrong with the furnace, would they... Would they, what would they do in that case? I think they would notify the homeowner in that case where clearly they're to inspect the water heater, but if they see a blatant safety issue in a home of any sort, they're going to do like any police officer, fire officer, or code officer. They're going to alert the citizen to that. Now, whether we would take official action um, would be a judgment call. For example, if it's, if it's so dangerous that the homeowner is in peril, we might take an official action on that and remove them from a house till that gets fixed. Uh, but if it's just a... A mechanical problem that they see. I think the most inspectors have the good judgment to tell the homeowner what the issue is and and leave it to the homeowner to get that fixed. And we would continue. We would conduct and finalize our inspection on that water heater, and and go ahead and leave. Okay. So the only you now. So based on the recommended change to this, you're only going to be inspecting the item that's had the permit pulled on it. You're not inspecting other items that's necessarily. Okay. And then. Um, just, just for clarity, a homeowner, the homeowner that replaces their own hot water tank, are they required to get a permit? Yes. Okay. Are they allowed to do the, the work themselves and, and the inspector would come in and, and verify it's installed safe and per code? Yes. Okay. All right. That's all my questions. Thank you, sir. Commissioner Peter John. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, could, could you talk for a minute about uh, the fact that uh, we're involved and in also that this would... Um, be a change, and our MABCD folks are involved with second and third class cities in many parts of the Sedgwick County. And and how would this work through with those jurisdictions and uh, and uh, and kind of the timetable for that taking place? Sure. I had a call from a uh, city administrator who had some questions, and uh, and uh, I, th I thought it would be important to kind of get some clarity on the record when, when this comes up next month. Sure. Let, let me just kind of talk about the timeline here. Um, what I would do uh, after today is um, I'll get on the May 20th agenda and ask for a vote on finalization of this code and resolutions. I'd also have to go to the City of Wichita uh, City Council meeting and do this, go through the similar exercise. We try to involve, and as Lonnie mentioned, we did involve small towns in the discussion of this adoption. Um, when we adopt the code into the county and we have memorandum, memorandum agreements with nine other cities in addition to Wichita, we give notification of the code changes and offer any type of, if they have questions or issues, we can go out and meet with them. We did that when we adopted trade codes back in November of 2014. So we go to this body, we go to the city council, we get vote, and then we provide formal notification. I'll send a formal notification to each of the nine class two and three cities that we've adopted new code with the amendments, offer to come out and talk with, if they have code official on site, many of them do not. We provide their services. But if their police chief or their fire chief once has questions or a city administrator has questions, we'll answer questions and make sure they're clear of, of what we've adopted and what's what we're doing moving forward. Thank you. Okay. Questions? Other questions from the Commissioner? Commissioner Hal. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, sorry for the second bite at the apple here, but uh, reading the rest of this resolution, I'm, there is a couple of other items I think that are, are not ones that you highlighted, but I do I have some curiosity about them. Okay. One of them is this interconnection requirement for the smoke detectors. Is that just for new construction, or if, if you have some reason to? Can you explain that a little bit? That that is that is for new construction only. Um, with existing con construction, I've got Bud Lead Assistant Director and um, Stoney Nethercott's mechanical chief here, and I'll, I'll look to them to make sure I don't misspeak. Uh, misspeak. Um, with new construction, the detectors uh, being installed have to be electrically uh, interconnected inside the house. In other words, it won't, they won't be battery-operated systems. In existing homes, the homeowner has a choice of, and actually what we're discussing today is given total choice of when to do it and how to do it, what kind of product to purchase to do it. So they can have battery operated or they can have electrician come out and, and wire it into the house. So um, did that answer your question? Or uh, Yes, okay. it does. Um, and that would only be for smoke detectors, not for carbon monoxide detectors? No, that's carbon detectors. monoxide detectors too, sir. Okay, I'm, I'm reading this very carefully, and I'm not seeing that language on CO detectors. I'm only seeing it on smoke detectors. But uh, so this may be something that you might want to review. And sure. uh, 
think about that. Another, another one I'm interested in is this issue of decks. It said that the, uh, the deck must be designed by a licensed architect or engineer. So you have, to have a, you have to have a permit to install a deck, and it has to be designed by a licensed architect or engineer, and therefore someone who goes to Lowe's and does a, a design at Lowe's, for example, or Home Depot, and they print off all the plans for that. that, that does that satisfy the requirement? I'm going to have uh, Bud Lett come up and address that. I, I know the issue with decks comes up because we've had a number of incidents with deck in this jurisdiction causing injury and death. But let me let Bud answer that question directly. Good morning, Commissioners. Bud Lett. Uh, we do not necessarily require any deck. It depends on the height. A lot of this came to light. Uh, and after the fatal injury to one of the area builders that happened over in Greenwood County a few years ago, uh, the Builders Association code officials sat down and put together the City of Wichita deck standards, which Sedgwick County prior to the uh, consolidation adopted as well. So that's what we use as the guidelines rather than what is set forth within the code. Okay, so I'm looking at this again, and it says that the it will, does require design by a Kansas licensed architect or engineer, and this is new language. This is something we're adding in this revision to the code. So the way this is written, if someone goes to Lowe's or Home Depot and they have a design done by the salesperson, is that going to satisfy this requirement? Yes, we're still okay inspecting them. Yes, they, they all require the inspection, so... Okay, I understand the inspection. You know, you have to pull a permit and you have to have it inspected. But my question is whether or not the design has to be done by someone with a license. Which, which section is it's it? It's on that page um, 11 of the resolution, section uh, 29, 2.4.480. Uh, R507 DEX, uh, the third line down. numbering is not the same as yours. One moment, please. <coughs> it does refer to a, a, a design standard. I'm not sure that a homeowner would even know necessarily what that means, but um, I think a lot of homeowners that, that, uh, that install decks um, do rely on uh, these home um, improvement centers to provide some type of plans. And they, they describe what they want and they generate some type of a plan that they print out and it uh, provides a low level of engineering, I think, but it is, you know, design they can follow. What this is mainly aimed at, sir, is the use of engineered type fasteners to something that has been designed, tested for that use to design, to fasten the deck to the house different types of attachments of the concrete post holding up the deck to uh, a concrete pillar for stability uh, instead of just using some homemade mechanism to to fasten that. Well, but since we're going to have some time between today and when we have to take any action on this, I'd ask you to review that section, please. And yes, sir. Help me understand. If there's a, if there's a new requirement that somebody has to have a, a licensed engineer do some type, something here, then I would like to know that. As I read this, it looks to me like that's the requirement, but maybe I misunderstand it. So uh, uh, just do me a favor and please review that, and let's talk about this at some point. Yes, sir. I'd appreciate that. And that's my only question for that. Um, and then I guess one more for Tom Stoltz, and I'll be done. I think I'll be done. <laughs> Tom, so the home builders, if they install the, uh, the carbon monoxide sensors in the home, and as I've read, some of the sensors, some of the, some of the newer, more expensive sensors have a, an alarm built in that tells you that the sensor is worn out mm -hmm. and it sends some type of a little beep or something that you have to try to figure out what's going on there. Um, some sensors don't have that feature. And um, so... I read some of the inexpensive sensors are, are designed for about five years. They can be less, depends on their, the humidity and dust and things like that. And uh, for sensors that are kind of typical, seven years is kind of like the, the round number. And then there are some that are kind of the, the Cadillac models that go as many as 10 years, and they may have lithium, you know, lithium bi batteries in there that cannot be replaced, and you have to replace the entire unit. Um, the home builders, if they, if they install these, and, of course, the... 
The entire structure now is, is considered safe and per code. It's, uh, everything's been inspected. The hot water tank's brand new. Furnace is brand new. Um, these things are going to wear out between the time the homeowner you know, goes into a brand new building and it, probably before those devices fail. Could be. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm curious as to how this mandate is really solving a problem when the detector wears out before the hot water tank or the furnace. If those are the, I mean, there may be other issues like maybe the, someone in the in the attached garage would run a car and that would mm -hmm. certainly alert the homeowner that something's wrong. But to, to, with respect to the, these devices failing, that doesn't necessarily. Um, well, the 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 issue is the fact that these devices have life expectancies. Yeah. Smoke detectors and carbon monoxide detectors, depending on what product you're looking at, generally between five and ten years industry standard. Some of the models will actually, um, you fill out paperwork and you put down the date five years from now and you're automatically supposed to change your, your, your detector. Um, some are re recommending seven, some are recommending ten. Homeowner has responsibility in this too. They have to read that, they have to know about it. Um, when, on existing homes, when we leave literature behind, that's going to be part of the literature. These devices have, have life expectancies and um, the burden is on you, the homeowner, to change the devices at a time which you decide. We're not going to come out at seven years, knock on your door, and regulate that you change a detector. You'll have to do that on your own. So part of this is education. Um, things can go wrong with, with gas-fired appliances. Um, that's why there's so many mechanical uh, firms in this town. Things will break on furnaces. Things will break on water heaters, and it causes problems. And I guess I look at carbon monoxide detector regulation similarly to how we looked at smoke detectors many, many uh, years ago. Um, we see problems occurring in the community. We see sickness. We've had one fatal here in the city of Wichita in the last year. And um, we, we go after the something is better than nothing model, which is putting these detectors in, flawed as they are, and the fact that they're probably going to need replacement five, seven, or ten years is better than nothing. And that's what the regulation is all about. So um, I think that along with this regulation has to come a strong dose of, of um, education and to notify new homeowners that the brand new system that they're getting in today, along with the brand new water heater and the brand new furnace, can break down over time. And the detectors are designed to last for no more than 10 years. And you need to look at you, the homeowner, need to have the responsibility and foresight to replace those when it breaks down. And on existing homes, to educate people to what, why they should put them in and let them pick whatever model, whatever expense that they want to put in. And we have something there which is better than nothing. Okay, that's a good answer. All right, I will. Uh, I think I'll stop for now. I do have other minor questions, but I just need some time to think about it. And I will your, just right. comment on the deck standard issue. Um, well, there's a lot of things that happen in residential and commercial buildings where we require some type of engineer stamp or some type of engineer certification that that device is safe. And I think that's where we're at on the deck standard. We'll double check on that. But if Lowe's sells you a deck and there is a operator's manual or an operator's description of exactly how that's supposed to be built, we will hold you to that. You have to build it to that standard. And then all of the things within that deck kit that you buy, probably if Lowe's is selling it, already has an engineer stamp on it. And we will be checking for that to make sure that 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 is the standard, uh, no matter who puts the deck up, whether the homeowner does or whether the contractor does, to make sure that those parts and pieces that make up that deck are at an industry standard that has been accepted by professional engineers. That's what we're really looking for there. But we will double check that, sir. It'd be interesting to know whether or not there's any uh, sense of, I, I guess, the difference between a deck that's, say, a low level, a uh, four feet or something to the ground versus a deck that's a yeah. second level type deck. There is a difference. And, and as Bud mentioned, the higher those decks get, the more exotic they get, the bigger they get, the more liability, the more risk, and the more we tune in to make sure that the standard is there. If you're building a deck on ground level, the risk of, of harms if something fails on that are pretty nominal. But if you're building a deck on a second story and you're going to have a party on it, and you can get on the Internet um, every other week and see a deck is, has collapsed under people taking wedding pictures or they put a certain number of people up, and, and those are always a hand badly. So that's, uh, I think that's the, the, the reason for the amendment. That's the reason for the consideration here uh, and what the city and the county went through back in 2010 when they adopted the standards. So. I guess I'd like to maybe ask you to, to consider whether or not the uh, more stringent standards ought to be applied, ought to apply to those decks that are 
perceived to be more dangerous because right. of the height or whatever. Yeah, if the low level sense. decks maybe ought to be exempted from that, perhaps. I think that makes sense. My reasonable, okay. reasonable consideration there. All right. All right. Well, that, that's enough questions for now. Thank you again. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Tom, I have a few questions. First, going back to that interconnection part there, is that in the code now or is this new? Was It's in the code now. So this is just our amendment just to keep it consistent to how it was before. It, he, he's nodding yes. It, it is It is in the 12 code, if that's the question. No, I'm talking about in our code right now, the 2006 or the way we have been is this a requirement for us now? Interconnection. Well, sir, uh, carbon monoxide detectors are not required until we adopt the 12. But as far as interconnection of smoke alarms, that has been in the code for probably three cycles now, to where they, in new construction, then they must be interconnected. For, for fire? Yes, for the yeah, smoke. Yeah, that, 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 that's my question. I'm just clarifying. Okay. okay. Now, I have some more questions on, you sent us this paper that talks about the changes from 2006 to 2012. Mm -hmm. I have a few of these. I just want to clarify exactly what this is doing. Um, and I don't know who best to talk about. The first one is the first one. That's R101.2, Created Living and Work Units. I'm going to, I'll let Bud feel these on the, on the change. I got it right here, Bud. Sir, that's something that came into the code in, I believe it was the 2009 cycle where they looked at, uh, such as the art district down right down from uh, the interest arena to where it's a studio type arrangement where they could live in this a portion of this and have the other portion as a studio of some type. So this was created. Uh, the live work unit was created to to control those, or not necessarily control them, but to set forth what requirement. Because you may be living there, but you may also be allowing the public to come in if it is a studio to view your work and such as that. So there's, it's not exactly the same as a residential. Okay, so the change the change from 2006 2012 is 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 the stuff in italics. Is that right? I mean, so I'm just trying to understand what the what the, the italicized is. portion that is that section was taken directly from the code book. I cut and pasted it, and that is the way the code is written as far as the italicized part. Is that your? But I'm saying, what is, are those italicized parts? The changes from 2006. I'm trying to figure out. For example, it looks like does it, it adds accessory structures. Is that a change from the previous code? No, sir. We've had accessory structures. Anytime you have a, a residence and you build a an additional garage, shop, chicken house, whatever it is, it is an accessory. I'm, I'm don't okay. understand. I guess, well, sir. This document we were given says these are significant changes from 2006 to IRC to the 2012. What is different about? Is what I'm trying to say. Oh, oh. Um, well, I've tried to bring out the things that that are different that are new that have come into the code, and that's what the purpose I, of this. Okay, so what's new about this? About the live work units? Yes. They previously didn't have anything in the code regulating them. They only you had a, a business type occupancy where you were allowing public to come into your house or you had a residence where you typically live. So they have combined that into to one where you can by following the code you can have a art studio or something that you may allow the public to come into to view your work, plus you, you're allowed to live in it as well. Okay, but I thought you said this was in the code for the last. No, no. So this this whole thing is new. Yes, okay, sir. I got yes, sir. I'm sorry. All right. The, the next one is habitable attics. Um. So you're saying this whole ha habitable attic definition is new? It, it hasn't existed in previous codes. No, sir. It did not. It. Uh, it's for like to to 
regulate how they do we like they like to call them a bonus room now that's above a garage or something that that to to be habitable i think the point you're getting at for it to be habitable it has to have some means of allowing light to come in as well as some means of escape uh such as a window in case of a fire oh, okay and so that yeah that goes to the next question which is on the next page which is r310 Point one, which says emergency escape and rescue. So to clarify, then habitable habitable attics now would require an emergency escape where it hasn't before. <coughs> they weren't really. That was one of the re, the unwritten requirements that if someone were going to at the time we're doing our inspection, say I'm going to have this a bonus room, we would advise them, hey, you have to have a means of egress from that to be able to use that room as habitable. We don't have unwritten requirements. But that's another issue for another day. Uh, well, pardon me, but, I misspoke. But, 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 well, no, I think you accurately described what's probably has gone on, but that's the problem. But in the past, habitable addicts by code have not required to have a window. No, we, sir. They, we, we would not allow an attic to be used as habitable space unless there was a window. Now we have a section in the code that puts that language in there. But we can't stop people from doing something that's not in the code already. I think Tom knows where I'm getting at. We need to address that issue. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I think, I think the change, I think what was happening before we were talking about adopting the 12 here is what has bothered us throughout this merger is you have unwritten rules. What the 12 code's doing here is allowing people the ability to have habitable space in an attic if they so choose, and it lays out the few requirements necessary if you want to have that so that the inspectors and the plan people that, that design this don't have to guess anymore. It's in the code now, and that's why there's a change. In the 06, it was silent. It didn't address that, and so what the inspectors back in 06 and 07 had to do was go out and recommend strongly you shouldn't do that because it's dangerous. We don't have to do that anymore if we adopt this code. It's in there. The rules are clear. The inspections can be clear, and, and the builders are clear. So that's, what, that's the significant change between the 6 and the 12 that this is talking about. Okay, but to clarify, according to, if we go by the code prior to now, it wasn't required. That's correct. Okay. There was no guidance. And... Carbon monoxide, we've already talked about those. Soil tests. So you're saying the requirement for soil tests, I know the MABCD has, has a deal, but soil tests weren't required by code prior to now. They were, correct me if I'm wrong, Bud, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but in 2010, if you're talking about soil tests on uh, uh, slab home uh, kinds of development, we had uh, issues in Wichita as Cedric County in 29, 2010, 2011, where a number of these houses were failing. And so the county and the city got together along with builders and redesigned the slab standards and the accompanying soil test required to properly put in a, a slab thick enough in whatever the soil condition is, and, and our soil changes in this, in this county uh, dramatically change depending on what part of the county you're in, um, to require these soil tests now gives us definition on, and that's been in, in, in uh, uh, effect since 10 and I think what we're recommending here in the, in the changes now there are some languages catching up in the code and, and but I'll let you correct me if I'm wrong on any of that, that that's correct Th that's what Got I'm that to one clarify right. we have our local code but this is the first time the IRC has has had this soil test has requirement. addressed it yes has addressed it yes but, but our intent is we'll address it with our already agreed upon correct local codes and procedures right? yes okay and then one last one, uh, question. There was one that talks about asphalt shingles. You. Um, well, well, what is this doing? Because I'm surely we had standards for asphalt sh shingles. It's on the last page. Yes, there have been standards for asphalt shingles. Uh, what it's what it's referring to there now. Uh, is a standard, an ASTM standard, uh, mainly to make sure that the shingles that are being sold to the public will meet the requirements of the code for wind, uh, for, to keep them from blowing off, and it's set and forth to where these are the standards that are followed. The codes nowadays, as they develop, are getting more 
prescriptive that the older versions of the code just wrote down you you shall do this you shall do that now they're developing uh, prescriptive methods to tell you that this shingle is one that is required to have this testing on it uh, to meet the code does that answer your yeah it does so how many how many shingles out there being sold that don't meet these requirements already and what's very few of them okay is there a cost differential or why I guess I'd like to have a little more information as to there would probably be a cost differential on it but most of your uh, wholesalers your um, Lowe's Home Depot's your big box stores are are selling products that do meet this uh, the manufacturers the the major manufacturers don't manufacture unless they're meeting that that requirement I can get you some more information on that, sir, if you would like as well. Yeah, I, 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 pro I think I would on that. I, th those are all the questions I have for now. I appreciate your time. That helps clarify it. Uh, Thank you. The information. Are there any other, Commissioner Howe? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just have one more question for Tom or, or whoever, but uh, if, can you speak to the issue? Let's just say someone uh, it does install these detectors in their home. And for whatever reason, they become inoperative. They're they're they, they're beyond usable usable life. And they didn't replace them, and or in the case of a smoke detector, they they didn't didn't replace the battery or whatever it was. And so they're not operable. And some incident happens. Does that set up any arguments for an insurance uh, discussion about who's liable for uh, the injuries or death or or structure damage, that type of thing, when the homeowner was negligent, not uh, providing the safety devices as required by this code? I'm not aware of any cases where that's. Um come up and that's maybe a better question for legal but uh, in, uh, in this issue of CO detectors what we're going to require on new homes is the presence what we're going to require on the ex what we're recommending that we do on existing homes is that we we give notification we educate and the homeowner has to take responsibility um, I can't imagine we definitely government definitely wouldn't get into a fray if somebody didn't change their batteries in their smoke detector. I mean, we're not going to get into a fray on that. Now, whether an insurance company chooses to deny claim on that, I guess is up. To, I, I, I just, I'm just not qualified to answer that question. I I, and, and I know you, I'm not a lawyer either, so I guess I would ask my county counselor to uh, to develop an opinion on that aspect, whether this changes any liability arguments if we require something in a home and. Is deficient for some reason uh, through, through negligence of the homeowner. Does that create an argument that the homeowner is now liable for uh, injury of someone else in their home, or or maybe a unintentional harm? You know, uh, may, you know, may, I can't imagine what the, what the charge would be, but some kind of a charge, a criminal charge, as a result of or a liability charge based on the fact that they were negligent to maintain those safety devices in their home. So I guess I would ask county counselors to kind of think, maybe think about that and develop some type of some type of an opinion to guide us on that answer. It'd be okay. We'll do that, Commissioner. Thank yeah, you. You know, every time we every time we amend something, I mean, codes. As I as I said in my initial statements, these codes are put out there as best practice, minimal best practice. Every time we amend it, we think about what you're just talking about right there. Is if we don't require this, what happens? How culpable is the county if we deviate from national code? And so the burden is on us to explain rationality and reasoning why we amend. Even on the, uh, if we take and on the existing buildings and we give notification instead of the mandate, instead of the regulation that we make people put CO detectors in, what does that do to county exposure? Um, and, and those are questions we talk about. All I can tell you is we've vetted this with the builders. We have local control over these amendments, the policy makers, county commission, city council. We have local control and we try to minimize exposure for the government bodies at every stretch of the way on these issues. So we'll be glad to look into that. But we we talk about that a lot on any of these 32 amendments is if we deviate from this, what are the harms that could happen as a result of them? And many of these, most of these are, there's no harms. It's just a, it's a money issue, a local issue where the builders are confident they're still building a quality product with these amendments in place. Uh, when you get into detectors, smoke, CO, life safety, direct life safety, we talk about that a lot. And I guess just for clarity, I would, I'm asking the county council to consider the uh, the perspective of the homeowner, the liability differences that might happen as a result of negligence over these over these codes. Understood. 
That's all. And uh, again, again, thank you for your okay. for your thoughts there, Tom. Um, you're asking us to uh, defer the uh, proposed resolution until a future meeting, May twenty, yes, sir. Specifically, May twentieth. Okay. Um, I'm sure we'll have a motion to do that. I'll. I would encourage you to to get with commissioners all along this process to make sure they're prepared to. Very good. To hoop approve. houses too individually. Ho hoop. Well, yeah, e everything, but just in general, because okay. if we need a, I don't want to have the decision unless all commissioners are prepared to, to make a vote and have all their questions good, answered. Sir. So Understood. if we need to postpone it, let's know up front, okay? Yes, sir. And then, and you know, the issue of just brought up here about habitable addicts, and if if the code is silent, then the discretion should be to the homeowner or builder. Agree. And I don't know if we need to put that in policy. Now, I understand the justification in the past of requiring windows and, and attics, but we didn't have authority in the code to do that. And I know you've, you're aware of the situation. This isn't the only thing. This is an example that we're bringing up today. Yeah. But we've got to get that idea out there and to the inspectors that um, if the code is, is silent, it's silent, and mean, that means the discretion goes to them. That's correct. So um, That's what we like this amendment. That's why we like this change in the code is it, speaks out to it and gives us clarity so that we the builders and the inspectors know what the rules are but well, i'm with you i understand maybe we maybe we need another statement in our in our code that specifically states that okay so um to make it very clear so that is in writing so that then the builders and developers and homeowners can point to that and say listen this is what your code says okay. i mean so that we can avoid some of these future problems and then if there are or issues like this, then it needs to be brought up and decided if we need to add it to our code or not, as opposed to just arbitrarily having informal, whatever it was called, an informal requirements that aren't really in the code. So, okay. And I think we're in the same line on that. Yes, we're in agreement on that. So, Commissioner Peter John. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to make a motion that we defer this item until May 20th, 2015. I'll second that motion. And before we go on, I'll say, Tom, I appreciate how you're handling this as far as having the meeting, um, getting feedback, and you will continue to take feedback in the interim yes. from the public and anyone else. So we want to get that out there to make sure there's plenty of time for feedback and plenty of time for the commissioners to get their questions answered and, and, and uh, form a related opinion on this item, and I appreciate that. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Clerk, call the vote. Commissioner Unruh? Aye. Commissioner Norton? Aye. Commissioner Howell? Aye. Commissioner Peter John. Aye. Chairman Randall. <coughs> Aye. Next item, please. New business item L: consideration of a grant in the amount of four million one hundred fifty-seven thousand six hundred eighty-eight for community corrections adult offender programs in Cedric County. Good morning, commissioners. I'm Stephen Stonehouse from the, Depart the Department of Corrections. I'm here to talk to you this morning about the state fiscal year 2016 comprehensive plan. Community corrections is a state-mandated program in the adult corrections system which serves as an alternative to prison. Community corrections provide intensive community-based supervision programs to re rehabilitate offenders in the community. These programs serve 2,700 individuals annually with an average daily population of 1,600 and more than 1,200 admissions each year. Community Corrections is a state funded through an annual grant process administered by the Kansas Department of Corrections. An annual plan must be submitted on or before May 1st to continue to receive these grant funds. The plan for state fiscal year 16 is before you today for approval. The plan reflects continuation of the adult intensive supervision program and the adult residential facility. Sedgwick County's planning allocation is $4,157,688. This is a reduction of approximately $129,000 from the current uh, year award and represents base funding for these programs. Additional funding to support these programs comes from fees paid by clients, grants for spe specific purposes, and some county funding. Annually, community corrections agencies receive a planning allocation from the state to use in preparing a budget for next year's plan. The legislature is still in session and the state budget has not yet been approved. Once the budget is approved and we're notified of our actual award, we'll make it necessary changes to fit our proposal to the available resources and we may be back with changes depending on what happens with the budget. We expect this to be hopefully complete by June but 
we're waiting for the legislature. This plan before you contains a great deal of data we use in managing our program. We're happy to report a 4% improvement in individuals successfully completing probation over the previous year. Unfortunately, when compared to the rest of the state, Sedgwick County has a 14% higher rate of probation failures. We work closely with Wichita State University and our Corrections Advisory Board to understand the data and implement strategies to improve these outcomes. We've learned that factors contributing to the probation failure rate include the severity of criminal involvement in the urban population we serve, high unemployment, gang involvement, and differences in judicial handling of the sentencing and probation violations across the district. The plan also outlines strategies we are working on to reduce recidivism by focusing on high-risk offenders. The Community Corrections Advisory Board participated in the development of the plan and approved it at their meeting on April 9th. It is their recommendation in mind that you approve the State Fiscal Year 2016 application for submission to the Kansas Department of Corrections. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Commissioners. Are there any questions? Commissioner Howell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was just curious if uh, you can tell me what's the history of this grant that we've been doing this for a number of years. This is, for, this is just for one year, so I assume this is something that's happened in the past. Yes, sir. The Community Corrections Act dates back to the mid-'80s, I believe, and Sedgwick County has been a participant ever since. Okay, and I'm looking through my paperwork here. What's the uh, county's match to this? What, what, what's our obligation? There is no obligation. Okay. The county chooses approximately $400,000 is committed, okay. and some years we've used all of it, some years we've used less than all of it, just depending on what happens with with, the, with our caseloads and with our operations. Right. But there's no requirement, the, the Kansas Department of Corrections does not require a hard match by the, county, by the county. All right, well thank you. Mr. Chairman, I would make a motion that we approve the application for the grant and if awarded, authorize the acceptance of the grant and establish establishment of a budget authority as approved, as provided in the financial considerations section of this request. Second. Commissioner Peter John. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just wanted to uh, throw out um, my appreciation for the fact that despite the uncertainty based on the fact that we don't know what the legislature this year is going to do, you're bringing this up in front of us today and, and we're in advance of the date. I, I've, I've struggled sometimes with some of the grants where we're retroactively and we're already into the year and, and uh, this one, of course, doesn't start until July 1, so I just wanted to uh, express my appreciation on that. This is an important grant, and I do plan to support it today. Thank you. Thank you. Say no other comments. All the vote, please. Commissioner Unruh. Aye. Commissioner Norton. Aye. Commissioner Howell. Aye. Commissioner Peter John. Aye. Chairman Ransell. Aye. I'm assuming Lonnie didn't want to speak on that item. <laughs> <laughs> Next item, please. Item M. Consideration of a grant application in the amount of three million two hundred and seventeen thousand six hundred and two for the Kansas Department of Corrections Juvenile Services SFY sixteen funding. Good morning, Commissioner Stephen Stonehouse again for the Department of Corrections. Um, each year, Sedgwick County must submit a application for state block grant funding to provide juvenile justice programming to prevent and address delinquency. The application before you includes funding for one prevention program and three mandated graduated sanctions programs. On April 3rd, the Juvenile Corrections Advisory Board, Team Justice, gave their approval for the programs and funding amounts for this application and recommends your approval. The total planning allocation for our district for state fiscal year 2016 is $3,217,602. This amount is $43,926 less than the grant award for the current year. The funding recommendation for prevention includes the detention advocacy services, program totaling $167,327. The Detention Advocacy Services Program provides attorney services to juveniles at detention hearings and in alternative case management programs so offenders may be released from detention pending court action. The program is provided by Kansas Legal Services. The remainder of the funding application is for state mandated graduated sanctions program operated by Sedgwick County Department of Corrections. These programs include the Juvenile Intake and Assessment Center, Juvenile Intensive Supervision Probation, and Juvenile Case Management. The recommended funding amount is $3,050,275. All three programs develop budgets based on needs. The recommended funding for intake and assessment is $722,252. Intensive supervision is $701,514. Case management is $1,626. One million six hundred twenty-six thousand five hundred nine dollars. 
The good news in juvenile justice is that the numbers are down. Juvenile arrests are down, case filings are down, and out-of-home placements have gone down since 2009. Arrests are down 44%, detention population are down 2%, case filings are down 22%, and admits to state custody is down 31%. Over the last four years, state funding to Sedgwick County has declined by 9%. I request your approval of the state fiscal year 2016 application for submission to Kansas Department of Corrections Juvenile Services, and I'll be happy to answer any, que any questions. Commissioner Howell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Once again, can you uh, describe the history of this grant? How long has this been going on? Any idea? This has been going on. Juvenile justice reform happened in 1998 when we brought it to Sedgwick County. So annually, we've been going through the same process. There's two parts, the prevention, which has fluctuated because it's not mandated, and then the, the required programming, the three core programs have always been required. So our preventions, we've went from many programs to one but since 98. You mentioned this is $43,000 less than last year's yes, application. Okay. Now, why is that? The, um, our caseloads are down, quite frankly, okay. and also the, um, the state has offered less money. So this is calculated from caseloads? It's a caseload study, and um, based on the population and supervision plans we complete, there's a formula that the state uses for each judicial district. Does this represent the maximum we could apply for? Yes, sir. Okay. And uh, again, 9% decline, was, uh, what, what period of time was that for again? That was for the 9% decline was since 2009. Okay. All right. Well, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion that we approve the application for this grant and, if awarded, authorize the acceptance of the grant and establishment of a budget authority as provided in the financial considerations section of this request. Second that. We have a motion and a second. Seeing no other comments, Madam Clerk, call the vote, please. Commissioner Unruh? Aye. Commissioner Norton? Aye. Commissioner Howell? Aye. Commissioner Peter John? Aye. Chairman Ransaw? Aye. Thank you. Next item, please. Item N, the report of the Board of Bids and Contracts regular meeting on April 16, 2015. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Joe Thomas, Purchasing Director. Uh, the meeting of the Board of Bids and Contracts of April 16th uh, results in seven items that we bring to your attention this morning. Item number one is change order number five for the jail master control upgrades for the facilities department. This recommendation is to accept the change order with Compton Construction Corporation for $269,620 and acknowledge contract completion date will be extended an additional 70 days for a new substantial completion uh, date of August 5th, 2015. Item number two is the scanning and indexing services. The recommendation is to accept the uh, best proposal from BIS Incorporated at the base pricing listed and execute a contract for one year with two one-year options to renew. Item number three is the tandem axle dump trucks for f uh, fleet management. Recommendation is to accept the low responsive bid from Summit Truck Group, uh, doing business as Roberts Truck Center, in the amount of $722,405. Item number four, 2015 Bond Tech for Public Works. The recommendation is to accept the low bid from Cornejo and Sons, LLC in the amount of $876,408.25. Item number five is the CS2 Crush Stone for Public Works. The recommendation is to accept the low bid from Bannon Trucking LLC for an initial purchase of $26,500 and establish contract pricing for one year with two one-year options to renew. Item number six is Stone for Aggregate Ditch Lining and this is for Public Works. Recommendation is to accept the low bid from Pearson Construction, LLC, and this is for an initial purchase in the amount of $40,275 and establish contract pricing for one year with two one-year options to renew. And the final item, item number seven, is a light 18-inch stone for riprap for Public Works. Recommendation is to accept the low bid from Pearson Construction, LLC, and this has an initial purchase of $26,850 and established contract pricing for one year with two one-year options to renew. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have on any of these items, and I recommend approval of all. Commissioner Howell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On item number one, uh, do you have a second uh, item on that uh, on this sheet? talks about replacing 76 detention lock sets. I think I discussed this with uh, someone in the jail, and these are... Uh, 
basically was driving this is a um, the old I guess the old equipment is obsolete is that correct and requires a fairly significant amount of work to to bring these doors up to uh, what's available to make them functional again is that right yeah. yes I believe that's correct I'll let Steve class if he has more he may I, have I, I guess more in, details. in that respect I, I'm going to support the motion today but I guess I would ask um, what, this is going to take care of I guess one pod that we've got and we've got a lot of pods ahead of us still so we know this is going to be a continuing expense for a long time into the future and it's going to be millions of dollars at the end of the day. I'm just curious if we asked any, uh, have, we, have we ever done an r for p to find out if someone can develop, this is Wichita, we've got uh, f fantastic people out there that can uh, come up with all kinds of innovative solutions. I would ask that we would do an r for p to uh, consider um, companies that could do a form fit function replacement and not have to do the large expense to completely rework that door. So I would support the motion today, but I would like to ask what we would do R4P to, uh, to allow other companies to develop proposals to do a form fit function to save money in the future for the other pods. As I've talked with uh, engineers around the community on this issue, I think there's a lot of interest that um, uh, I think there's even existing companies that would be interested in potentially developing something that would make this a, a very cost effective option for us to consider. So anyway, with that, I would support the motion, Mr. Chairman. I would ask that we would approve. My motion is to approve the recommendations of the Board of Bids and Contracts. We have a motion and a second. Any other questions or comments? Commissioner Unruh? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Joe, the uh, item number two on the bid board um, has, uh, I think there's eight bidders. The one that the winning bidder is uh, substantially <coughs> lower than the other bidders. Uh, and I, I trust the analysis of the bid board, but uh, we will be monitoring that as it goes forward to make sure we get the uh, performance that we uh, requested, I suppose. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, that's just what I want to, to see done. We can follow that up because it just, uh, I realize there's economies of scale and there's different uh, technology available, but that's uh, a remarkable difference in the bid price. So if we just let me you know, keep me posted on how well they're performing. Sure. And we saw that pricing. Uh, we, we reviewed it pretty closely uh, because we wanted there was such a big difference. Uh, but we were pretty happy with the results that we got. But we will continue to mon monitor it, make sure it lives up to its Well, if we standard. can get what we want at that price, well, that's a great deal. So. Okay. Thank you. That's all I had. <laughs> Motion is second. See no other questions or comments. Call the vote, please. Commissioner Unruh. Aye. Commissioner Norton. Aye. Commissioner Hall. Aye. Commissioner Peter John. Aye. Chairman Ransall. Aye. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Next item, please. Consent agenda. Commissioners, you have the consent agenda O through T items O through T, and I'd recommend you approve. What's the will of the board? I move approval of the consent agenda as presented. Second. Madam Clerk, call the vote. Commissioner Unruh? Aye. Commissioner Norton? Aye. Commissioner Howell? Aye. Commissioner Peter John? Aye. Chairman Ransall? Aye. Now we're to the legislative issues portion of our agenda, and I don't believe we have any updates on that, so we'll go to the other portion. Commissioners, are there any commissioners have anything for the other portion? Commissioner Howell? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd just like to, I would just like to point out that we have a couple of birthdays this week on the uh, board. Uh, the two gentlemen to my right have milestone birthdays. Uh, Mr. Mr. Commissioner, you're out of order. Oh, <laughs> well, so said the 50-year-old chairman. Thank you very much. That's all I've got. I'm kidding. All right, that's all. Thank you. Well, uh, I was going to say happy birthday to both of you. Uh, they both hit milestones this week, and it's going to be... Uh, uh, all downhill from here, so that's all. <laughs> that's all. Thank you, Mr. What, Chairman. What's Commissioner Peter John's milestone? 65. Ooh, wow. 65 and 50, if you don't mind me sharing that with the public. No, that, that. <laughs> there you go. Now, when you say downhill from here, I'm going to say speak for yourself. All right. Best is yet to come. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Commissioner Peter John. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, it's it's a wonderful, uh, wonderful there's been some wonderful days in terms of weather, and I'd be remiss in pointing out that uh, Sedgwick County Zoo next month we're going to be reopening uh, there what, what has been, it's had a couple different names, but the, uh, but I, the new name is going to be the Tropical, uh, uh, tropical Building. Uh, it's also, I think, had, had some prior, prior names. But that's coming up next month, and if the weather's nice, folks might want to get out and enjoy it. 
But April 22nd is a very important day in American history, and uh, even some important worldwide events that affected everyone in America occurred on April 22nd. And I'd like to begin with pointing out the fact that in 1864, on April 22nd, in the midst of the horrible civil war that cost more American lives than in any other conflict we've been involved in, the phrase, in God we trust, was added to the uh, uh, American currency through legislation that was passed by Congress on this date. And on a, uh, and on an important note in terms of worldwide history, uh, one of the big butchers of the 20th century was born on this date, Vladimir Lenin. Um, but on a much more positive note, especially for those of us who uh, enjoy baseball, in 1876, on April 22nd, the National League began its very first season with the Boston Red Sox, Red Stockings, defeating the Philadelphia Athletics. Closer to home in 1889, on April 22nd, the Oklahoma Land Rush began, and thousands of homesteaders uh, hurried to stake claims on, on land south of us. And something I remember very well, 1970, uh, Earth Day was created for the very first time. And in the wake, people were talking about, you know, there's some national magazines, I believe it was Newsweek, had a big thing about uh, the global global cooling and what a threat global cooling was to us uh, back in the 1970s. So I point this out because April 22nd is an important day in American history, and I uh, wanted to get that on the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Unruh. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would just want to uh, remark that uh, several uh, members from Sedgwick County attended the Honors Night function last night to uh, recognize outstanding contribution to our community by um, companies, organizations, and individuals. And so uh, I think that will probably have full coverage in the paper, but just wanted to extend our congratulations to uh, those folks who were honorees last night. Also, um, I want to say I think that today's Administrative Assistant Day, and um, so especially want to give a shout out to uh, Lisa and Carol who helped us in our office, and uh, also to all those in county government who performed that function. Um, I know that we would, uh, I don't know about everybody else, but for me it would be hard to get along without them, so I appreciate what they do. That's all I have, Mr. Chair. Second your comments. Commissioner? Yeah. Thank you, Dave. Um, I have a question. Well, I want to talk a little bit about uh, Judge Riddell's Boys Ranch, and I have a question for the manager. I, I hate to put you on the spot, but I had some conversations with some people yesterday. We have put out an RFI with respect to Judge Riddell's Boys Ranch, correct? That's correct. And how much longer is that open? Uh, if my memory serves me correct, it's May. It's the end of May. Towards the end of May. Yes. Okay. Well, I, I just wanted to bring this up publicly because I'm, I'm not sure the word is getting around to everybody who might be interested. Um, the commission has instructed staff to include funding for Judd Rios Boys Ranch in the 2016 budget. That being said, we are looking at all the alternatives on how to provide that function and looking at the possibility of a, a partnership with a private entity that could help do that. So we put out a request for information for anyone who might be interested in, in, in running a YRC2 plus the additional functions that we've, we've done in the past, either at our facility at the Judge Riddell's Boys Ranch or in another facility that they may have. So, uh, Mr. Manager, I just ask that we'd follow up and make sure that request for information gets sent to anyone who's expressed a desire in the past. I know there was some interest in the past. Anyone who currently operates a YRC2, I want to kind of be proactive, get them out there, let them understand that we're looking at that. And I also want to express that, you know, there's been s some things said about the cost, needs a couple million dollars, this, that, and another. I don't want that to be a, uh, a barrier to people to show interest in this. I think the total cost and the urgentness, urgentness, I guess you would say, of the repairs it, is, has not just has not been exactly accurate. I think in the past, let's just say that, and, that sh and we're willing to work and negotiate all those options if someone desires to uh, to to run a YRCT YRCT at Lake Afton. All of that stuff is negotiable. We're looking for options, and we want people to uh, contact us if they have any questions or have any interest. So I wanted to get that out there on the record and and talk to you, Ron, since I hadn't had a chance since I had some conversations that I, I think some people weren't aware that that was out there and, and that we're trying to evaluate other options. So 
I appreciate that. Seeing anything, any other for other? Seeing none, we have no need for executive session today, is that correct? Is there any other business come before the board, Ms. Manager? So. Seeing none, we are adjourned. All right. Production and broadcast costs for Sedgwick.